Welcome. My name is Jeff Bartles. I'm an infrastructure technical specialist here at Autodesk, and I'm joined by my colleagues Jerry Bartles and Dana Judge for another installment of our 30-minute workout series. Today, we're going to be focusing on tips, tricks, and shortcuts. If you're unfamiliar with the 30-minute workout concept, this is a series of webinars that we put together to give us an opportunity to talk about and demonstrate some of the features and tools that really aren't shown during a typical training course. You know, many times when you take a, a training class in an Autodesk application, you're shown the need to know tools, the things that you need to know to do your job. But many of the other ancillary tools and, and um, you know, side tools that can be very beneficial to your job, uh, many of those things are the type of things that you just have to kind of pick up on your own over a, a career using the application. So we put together these webinars as a means of creating another resource to help get you acclimated to and help you explore some of these tools and help you make the most of your Autodesk investment. A couple of ground rules as we do these, uh, many of the tools that we show are shown in an abstract nature. Uh, this way we can focus on the functionality of the tool itself. Once you understand how the tool works, you can apply it to whatever situation works best for you. Since these sessions are only half an hour, it's very easy. We're hoping for people to get in, get out, and get on with their day. And we always record the sessions. So anybody who registered for the session will get access to the recording. The recording particularly will be very helpful today because we're going to be talking about a lot of things. If you uh, have a notepad or if you want to take and write something down, that's perfectly fine, but don't worry about trying to write a bunch of things down because you will have access to the recording afterwards. Today, we're going to be talking about a ton of tips, tricks, keyboard shortcuts, and command options covering a range of areas, everything from the interface to geometry creation tools to text to making modifications. I'm going to be showing these in a shotgun approach so that we can cover as much material as possible. I have always wanted to do a 30 tips and 30 minutes session, and we actually have less than 30 minutes now, so it'll be exciting to see if we can get through everything I want to talk about. As we go, um, if you have any questions about what's being covered, there is a Q&A panel and a chat area. Dana and Jerry will be monitoring that and answering any questions. Likewise, if, if you want to, if you place something in the chat, uh, we're more than happy to have one-on-one -on -one follow-up calls. Uh, with anybody who's interested after the session's over. So that's also another possibility. So this is going to be a PowerPoint-free zone. PowerPoint has no place in these presentations. So with that, I'm going to drop out of this, and we're going to get going. I'm in Civil 3D, and I'm running Civil 3D 2021, although everything that I show you here will work in virtually any contemporary version of Civil 3D or AutoCAD. I'm going to start by looking at some tips having to do with the interface. We're going to talk about palettes here for a second. I have my properties palette anchored to the interface here. I'm just going to drag this out by the name bar. Sometimes this is called the mast. As you drag palettes around on screen, you'll notice that as you get close to the edges, it wants to dock. Now, if I'd like to have this open all the time, maybe I can't afford to use up that much real estate for this palette. I'm a one screen kind of guy most of the time. So here's a shortcut. If I hold down the control key, I can drop a palette wherever I want in the interface and it will not dock. Another shortcut, if you double click on the name bar, it will flip from a docked to an undocked state or vice versa. So if I double click on this when it's anchored, I can take and pop it back out. So let me double click on the name. I did that with properties, but it'll work with any palette. This drawing has multiple layout tabs. I've got a plan sheet that I've started here. I've also got a general notes sheet. Much like the palettes, if you click and hold on a layout, you can drag these around and rearrange their order. Let me take and drag plan back here. If I drag a layout and hold my control key, you'll see the icon changes to a plus. This can be a quick way to create copies of layout tabs. I can do that with layouts. I can also do it with the entities in a file. For example, if I select these text entities, I can click and hold on them and drag them over and place them over here. Just a, a quick way to access the move command. Works great with text. Works great with anything that doesn't require the specificity of, a, of an object snap. In addition, I can select this text and I can click hold and drag. While I'm dragging, if I hold down the control key, you'll see the icon change to a plus. When I release my mouse button, you can see that I just made a copy. So just another shortcut to the copy command. I'm going to select these and I'll press delete. This drag and drop methodology will also work between drawings. If you look at the top of the screen, you can see I have a couple drawings open. If I'd like to view those side by side, I'm going to go to the view ribbon tab and down in the interface panel, I'm going to click tile vertically. and You can see an icon that kind of shows what I'm going to get. 
Now, on occasion, the Start tab wants to participate in this view. I really don't need that, so I'm going to minimize this, and I'll click Tile Vertically again. Let me click in this drawing here on the right. So, knowing what we just saw, I'm going to select this detail. I will then click and hold on the edge, and I can drag and drop this and place it in another file. I'm going to close this drawing. I'm not going to save changes, and I'll maximize my original drawing on screen. Since we have a layout on screen, let's talk for a second about viewports. I am going to, from the draw panel here, I will create a rectangle. Let's say this rectangle represents a viewport I'd like to create. Currently, this rectangle is a polyline. Before I turn that into a viewport, I'm going to change it into something else. I'll open the draw panel and I'll click the region button, and then I will select the shape and press enter. It is now a region. A region is kind of like a polyline, except it's a solid. Since it's a solid, it can be edited using Boolean commands like union and subtract, which can be very helpful with viewports. Let's take a look. To turn this into a viewport, I'm going to go to the Layout tab, and in the Layout Viewports panel, I'll open this menu at the top, and I'll say that I'd like to create a viewport from an object. I will then select my region. It's now a viewport. In fact, if I double click in this, we can see it works just like any other viewport. Let me zoom in a touch and I'll double click out. Sometimes when we have a viewport, we may wish to clip the viewport to accommodate other items on the title block, like this detail. Let's try that. I am going to create a rectangle. We'll place it around this detail. Now let's turn this rectangle into a region. I'll do that by going to the draw panel and I'll grab region. I'll click that and press enter. Now I have two regions. I'm going to use a Boolean command called subtract. After I launch the subtract command, I'd like to subtract from this, enter, I'll subtract this, enter. And you can see how quickly that I can notch that viewport. Now, it works with linear shapes. Does it work with more complex shapes like this circle? Let's try it. I'd like to turn this circle into a region. Now, I don't have to go back up to the ribbon if I don't want to. If I right click, in the menu, you'll find a recent input option, which will show you the last 20 commands that you've launched. So from here, I can choose region. I'll turn that circle into a region and I'll press enter. I'll come back and I'll say subtract. Subtract from this object, enter. I'd like to subtract the circle, enter. Very quick to make those changes. Now, let me delete this detail. After seeing how you take a notch out of this, you may be wondering, well, how can I take and put that back together again? I'm going to turn on a couple of object snaps here for a second. Let's create another rectangle. I'll create it from the corner here to the corner here. Let's turn this into a region. Once again, I have two regions. I will use another Boolean command called Union. And after I launch the Union command, I will select this object and this one, and I'll press Enter. Okay, so Definitely not the only way to create a viewport, but it, it is a way to create a viewport, and it's uh, just another tool that you have available to you in your toolbox. In the lower left corner of the title block, I've got some text that incorporates some fields. We can see the fields because of the gray boundary. Fields represent smart text. These are um, variables that are filled out automatically by the application. So by having this text on the title block, every time it's printed, uh, you'll have access to the file name. You'll also have access to the date it was printed. Knowing what we know now, I'm going to select this and then I will click and hold on it. I'll hold my control key and we'll drag this over and make a copy. I'd like to create a new field. I will double click on this text to edit. Now this is just single line text, but what I show you here would work with multi-line text as well. I'm going to type last saved by. And then to create the field, I will press control F. This brings up the field dialog box where I can select from one of those smart text objects. They are organized into categories. I will select a field that's tied to the document itself, and I'll come down and grab this field called Last Saved By, and I can see how it's going to be formatted. Notice I can adjust that here. So I'm going to keep it with all uppercase, and I'll click OK. I will then click on Screen to finish the command, and I'll do a quick regen. Now, every time this sheet is printed, in the corner of the sheet, I will find out who the last person was that made changes to this file, which can be very helpful in some cases. Let's go to the Model tab. This drawing includes an external reference. If I hover, we can see the XREF there. In fact, if I select it, it's even easier to see. I've got my External References Manager docked to the interface over here. We can see the reference landscaping. In the attachment here, I can see how it's connected. 
that's via attach. If I come down to the details area, I can see it's using an absolute path. I can change either of these items right from this palette. If I simply double click on the attachment type, I can flip between attach and overlay. If I right click on the reference, I can come down and change the path type. You know what? Somebody used absolute. These really should be relative. If I choose make relative, you can see how that how that changes. Once again, I'll come back down and we'll change that back. So we have the opportunity to do that very quickly. Let's look at uh, attaching another reference. I'll go bring up the external references manager and, and typically we could attach references using this button here. Or if I just right click in the middle of the palette, I can say I want to attach to another drawing. I'll select this drawing called insert demo and I'll click open. When I create an attachment to this file, I'm going to bring it in as an overlay. I am going to use a relative path and I'm not going to adjust scale, insertion point, or rotation. So bring it into the same coordinates as the original file. Now I obviously don't see it on screen, so I'd like to do a zoom extents. I'll do that by double clicking the mouse wheel. Has this ever happened to you before? Okay, obviously the file that I referenced is out in space somewhere. How can I find it? We can find it using the zoom command. If I type zoom and press enter, there is an option of the zoom command called object. I want to zoom to a particular object. I'll click object and then which object? I'll type L for last, the last object I created. And when I press enter, it will zoom on that. This is a very small circle here. This is probably worst case scenario. I've got the circle out. At, it's a coordinate 100 million by 100 million. So that's, that can be a really quick way to find objects that are out in space you know, when they're difficult to see on screen. Now that I know that that's obviously incorrect, I'm going to right click on the insert demo file here and I will choose detach. And then I will double click the mouse wheel to do another zoom extents. Okay. If we look down at the bottom of the screen, you can see that I am currently have my dynamic input, input mode turned on. We talked about this in a previous session. F12 will turn that on or I could click the icon. When dynamic input is turned on, if you hover over a grip, you'll see these additional accoutrements and text labels and things on screen. If you're like me and you have bad vision and you spend most of your day looking through the bottom of your corrective lenses, this text may be a little small to read. There is a system variable called tooltip size that will adjust the size of this text. By default, it's set to zero. The maximum I can set that to is six. Now, the minimum I can set it to is negative three. So you can actually make that text a little smaller if you want to. Now that I set that to six, if I hover over this grip, you can see the change on screen. Let me press escape. Now, if you're like me and you've got a bad memory, 10 minutes from now, you won't remember tooltip size, but you may remember part of it. Maybe I remember, you know, whatever that system very well was, it, it ended in size. If I come down to the command line, I can use wildcards to find commands and system variables. I'm going to use an asterisk, which means everything, and I'll type asterisk size, and it will show me every command or system variable that ends in size. So I can use this to find commands that start with a text string or end with a text string or include a text string. Let me choose tooltip size and I'll set that back to zero. As you learn commands or as you see commands in textbooks, sometimes they may be listed as just the command itself. You may wonder, you know, after using a command or typing it in, you know, man, I wish that is in the interface. How would I know where to find that? If you open the application menu, there is a search bar here at the top. This will tell you if you enter a command, for instance, I'm going to type plot, a very popular command. It'll tell me every place in the interface where I can find this tool. So I can see that it's in the quick access toolbar. I can see it's in the application menu. I can see it's on the output ribbon tab in the plot panel. Notice it also shows me every command that is related to plot. So this could be a great way to find commands uh, in the interface or find out how the, the many different ways that they can be launched. In fact, this isn't just a list. These things are hot. If I click on this, I can actually launch the plot command from here. Now, I don't want to plot this at the moment, so I'll go ahead and close that. Let's talk for a second about dialog boxes. Now, if I was smart, I had a dialog box open there on screen. I'm just going to open another one here for a second. Probably should have just kept the other one open. For right now, let's let's talk about any dialog box that allows you to enter text. Now, normally, we can put a text entry in there, or these will also support expressions if you use the appropriate syntax. I can type equals 12 divided by 0.25, and I'll press Alt Enter to calculate the expression. Let's try that again. Equals 
13 times 0.14. Alt enter. Okay, I'm doing it in the text style dialog box, but you can do it in virtually any dialog box where you have an entry that's looking for a number. You can leverage an expression. Okay, let's pan the drawing over. Here I've got a line segment. I'd like to create an arc coming off of this line. I know the start point of the arc and I know the center point. Let's draw that. I'm going to launch the arc command here. I'll start my arc from the end of the line. I know the center is going to be right here. Oops, I apologize. Let's try that again. Arc. I'm going to come down and dictate that I want to use center. Let's click the marker. And this is exactly the opposite of what I want. By default, the AutoCAD platform wants to draw arcs in a counterclockwise direction. If you hold the control key, you can force it to draw clockwise. Let's pan this over. Let's say I'd like to hatch the area bounded by these straight lines. Normally when we hatch, we have the opportunity of doing pick points or select objects. Unfortunately, neither of those options is going to help me here, because if I click in this area, the circles are going to get in the way, and I don't have a single object that I can select to hatch. Let's look at how we can hatch this. I'm going to click the Hatch button. It's asking me to pick an internal point. Instead, I'm going to come over and expand the Boundaries panel, and I can see that the current boundary set is using the current viewport. I'm going to click this button that says Select New Boundary Set. I will then select objects. Basically what I'm doing is saying, when I pick points, these are the only objects you're allowed to see. Let me press enter, and now if I pick a point in here, it will very quickly find that boundary. Great way to, to hatch something like this, or in the event you're trying to use pick points on a drawing that has thousands and thousands of items. Here I've got hatch that is associative to a polyline. Is it possible to take a hatch pattern and have it conform to a completely different boundary? Yes, the command is called hatch set boundary. I'll launch that command. I will click the hatch. I will then select the boundary and press enter. And then do I want to erase the line work? No, I'll just press enter to accept that. And you can see the hatch now conforms to this boundary and it's associative. Let's delete this original shape. Now, has this ever happened to you before? I'm going to select the boundary and delete it. If you delete a boundary, the hatch pattern is now no longer associative. I would like to recreate the boundary, and I would like the hatch to be associative to that recreated boundary. To do that, I can select the hatch and right click. From here, I'll choose Hatch Edit. In the dialog box, I'll choose Recreate Boundary. And now, how do you want to make the boundary? Region. We touched on that a little bit ago. Or Polyline. Finally, do you want to associate the hatch with the new boundary? Yes, I would. Let me press Enter, and I'll click OK. You can see it draws the boundary on the current layer, so I may have to adjust the layer property, but you can see that the new boundary, um, that, that hatch is associative to that new boundary. When we're dealing with hatch, many times it's important for that hatch to be to the back of the drawing so that it doesn't encroach on text or other line work. So how can we do that? There is a command called hatch to back. If I press enter after launching that command, you can see it automatically pushed 10 hatch objects to the back. After seeing that, you may be thinking, man, Jeff, you're, you typed that in. Is there a button for that in the interface? Well, there's a way to find out. Let's take a look. I'll open up the application menu and I'll type hatch to back. We'll practice what we preach here. Send hatches to back. I can see it's on the home ribbon tab in the modify panel under draw order. Let's take a look. Home tab, modify panel, under draw order. There's send hatches to back. As long as this menu is open, notice that there are also tools here to automatically bring text to front, or dimensions to front, or leaders to front, or bring all annotations to front. Just some, some nice things to explore there when you get a chance. Let me pan this over. Here I've got a line segment. Let's say I'm creating some conceptual geometry for a parking lot, and I'd like to sketch out the curb and gutter. Maybe I'm drawing B612 curb and gutter, so I would have to offset this line one foot to get to the flow line and then a half a foot to get to the back of curb. Normally, if I'm offsetting an object twice with two different dimensions, I have to launch the offset command multiple times. Not in this case, though. Notice that my dynamic input's turned on. That is a requirement for this trick. I will come down and launch the offset command, and then instead of entering a distance, I'm going to use the through option. This allows us to offset an entity through a point. I will select the object, but instead of picking a point, you can see with my dynamic input turned on, I can type a dimension. I can type one foot. I'm still in the command. 
I'll click the line and I'll type 0.5. Enter. Still in the command. I can click this line and then I can enter a different dimension. So using dynamic input with the through option, I can create multiple offsets at multiple distances using offset just one time. Let's talk about joining geometry. Here I've got a line and I've got an arc and I've got a polyline. Many times when we want to join, we tend to lean on the P edit multiple join option. Not necessary. If we expand the modify panel, there is a join option here. I can simply select those objects and you can see it very quickly creates a closed polyline. Let's click undo. Another thing I like about the join option is it will do multiple. So if I launch join, and I drag to make a selection. I'll even hit my space bar to change that. Remember, we looked at this a few weeks ago. I can select all of these disparate objects, and when I press Enter, it very quickly creates three closed polylines for me. Join also works with simple objects. Here I've got a line segment. Over here I've got another line segment. These are collinear. I'm going to tap my space bar to go back into the previous command. Using Join, I will select both of these objects and press Enter and it joined them and, and created a line segment. So, I mean, had I used like P-Edit or something like that, it, it would be a polyline and I'd have grips where I didn't need them. So that actually joined it back to a single line segment. Works with arcs as well. I'm going to tap my space bar to relaunch the last command. These arcs are collinear. So if I select both of these and press enter, it will join them again into an arc. Now it does matter which one you click first. Remember, arcs are drawn in a counterclockwise fashion. So had I picked this end first, it would have connected around this way. Well, let's talk for a second. Maybe I'd like to create some text, and I want to draw that text on the Notes layer. Typically, when we select a layer, we may use the Make Current button and then click the layer we're interested in to set a current. I don't have a Notes object here that I can click on. Instead, if I open the Layer Control, I can tap the first letter of the layer that I'm interested in. I'll type the letter N, and you can see it takes me to the first layer that contains that layer or contains that letter. Maybe I like the hatch layer. I'll press H for hatch. Okay. Can be perfect for finding some unique layers. It's, it's not the perfect solution for every case. I just want to show you that it is here. It can be very helpful. Just as an example, let me hit the letter B. Notice it takes me to the first layer that contains a B. Each time I tap B after that, it will take and jump to the next one. And I can simply hit enter when I see the layer that I want. So to get to notes, very easy. I can hit N press enter, I'm, I'm now on that layer. I'm going to create some multi-line text. I'll launch multi-line text and we'll take and create a rectangle here. Let's create some bulleted lists. Now normally we type, uh, you know, several lines there and we could come up and use the, I want to create a bulleted list and it will take and put bullets on there. Uh, but, you know, you only get one kind of bullet. What I want to show you here is multiple objects can be used as bullets. If I type a dash, for instance, and press the tab key, point one, enter, point two, enter, point three, let me backspace. Uh, let's use a plus sign. I can type the plus tab, point one, point two, point three. Can I use and asterisk, asterisk tab, yes. Okay, so if you have a need for additional bullets or if you want additional bullets, try experimenting with some of the characters available in the, in the font that you're using. Several of those can be used as bullets. Let's talk for a second about multi-leaders. Typically, when we create a multi-leader, we create an arrowhead first. We click the arrowhead, we pull it out, and we place the text. We don't have to, though. If Not every application creates leaders that way. Some of them do it a little different. If I launch the multi-leader command, notice there's an option down here. Let me hit arrowhead first. So that's the default. There's an option down here called content first. If I do content first, it will let me create my little M text box. This is my note. And I've ensured it fits here. Now I can take and place the leader after the fact. So we can go in uh, in both directions there, essentially, when creating multi-leaders. Let's pan this over. Here I've got some dimensions. Have you ever encountered a drawing with fudged dimensions? Have you ever received a drawing from someone 
and it has fudged dimensions. Or you wondered, could this have fudged dimensions? Dimensions that are incorrect can be catastrophic, especially if we're using this geometry in a construction situation. So how can I determine dimensions that have been faked? There is a command called dim reassociate. As I start typing that in, you can see there's actually two of them here. You want the short one. You want dim reassoc. If you launch that command, it'll ask you to select objects, type all, and press enter. Every fudged dimension will highlight, and then when you press enter again, they will be fixed to what the actual dimension is. Now, in this case, I've got a small example. The majority of my dimensions were fudged, unfortunately. But if I had a big drawing, and then I wanted to go back and find out, okay, which ones had fake dimensions on them? How can I establish that after the fact? If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we went to the properties palette. We talked about this select objects button. I can say select objects, P for previous. It will reselect the previous selection set. Let me hit enter to select that. And then I'll come over to the properties palette and I will simply put these onto a different layer. It could be called uh, fudged dimensions or something like that. I'm just going to grab this magenta layer here for a second. That'll make it very easy for you to scan the drawing and identify the ones that, that were incorrect. These are areas where geometry is going to have to be modified. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's do this. We are just about at the bottom of the list. I think we're going to make it. I just started another drawing here. This is an empty file. I just want to note that no matter what you do with the interface, as you launch commands, you're essentially driving the interface with text. Even though we're clicking a button here for polyline, for instance, if we look at the command line, you can see it just typed the command in for us. So as I pick points on screen, I'm, I'm entering coordinates, X comma Y. You can see there are sub options for this command. If I launch a sub option, what did it do? It just typed the letter A for me. So no matter, no matter what you do in the application, essentially you're, the, the application is being driven via text. Knowing that, you can create text files that you can drag and drop in here to drive the application. As an example, I have a text file that I created. I'll double click on this one. Just to show you, I created this in Notepad. As I was generating geometry and doing things on screen, I was keeping note of, of what was happening at the command line. Here I'm launching a rectangle. There's the coordinate of the start point. I enter D for distance. There's the distance in the X direction, Y direction. Here's the coordinate I clicked to, to finish the rectangle. I then do a zoom extents. Here I'm creating a linear dimension from this coordinate to this one. Here's where I picked to set the dimension. Basically, you can go through and set this up. I then saved this, except instead of having a text extension, it's got SCR for script. If you have a script file, you can drag and drop this into the application, and it simply plays that string of text at the command line. A ton of things we can do with this. Maybe one of these 30-minute workouts, we can get into scripts a little bit heavier. This is something that would be worth exploring. If you're interested in that kind of thing, let me select this and take it out. After seeing something like that, you may be wondering if it's possible. I mean, could you conceivably create an entire drawing that way? Let me drag in this other script file. The answer is yes, you can, because virtually everything that you do in the application is, like I said, it's, it's all text. So this is how I spent my Tuesday night. Generated a drawing. It's going through creating the layers. It's creating the geometry, and then it's going through and applying the hatch patterns to that. Okay, now you may be wondering, when would you ever need a script file to draw a picture of Bruce Lee? And the answer is never, because I'll give you this one. We'll make this available as a download with the video. What I'm trying to impress here is with a script file, you are only limited by your creativity. Okay, with that, let me jump out of this. We'll get back to this here, slideshow. So during the session today, we covered a ton of tips, tricks, keyboard shortcuts, and command options. I'm hoping coming away from this, you saw some things that maybe you hadn't seen before. Maybe this sparked some ideas that maybe you hadn't thought about until today. As I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions or if you'd like to have a follow-up one-on-one with Jerry or Dana or myself, please let us know. Put that in the chat box and we can follow up with you. That being said, I will check with Jerry and Dana. Are there any questions that came up that were not addressed? I, I think we're all cut up. Oh, fantastic. All right. So knowing that, I want to thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you guys again in a couple of weeks. Thanks.